Hi, everyone. This is Rohit from Lifestyle, Ma- Lifestyle Mastery. And I'm excited to have Wes Kao, uh, who's a co-founder of Maven, which is funded by First Round Capital and had other angel investors like Naval Ravi Khan and Sahil Loving here. Uh, previously, Wes was the co-founder and executive director of Seth Godin's Alt MBA under, under leadership Alt MBA crew from uh, zero to 550 cities in 45 countries in three years. Uh, and uh, she uh, serves as a mentor for Backstage Capital and WeWork Labs. Uh, Wes received her a uh, bachelor's in business administration from Haas School of Business at the University of California in Berkeley. Welcome to the show, Wes. Hey, Rohit. Thanks. Awesome. So, um, you know, how did you get into uh, startups and, you know, why why did you uh, focus on, on the field of education? I grew up in Silicon Valley. So startups were always um, something that I was surrounded by. I think as a kid, tech wasn't as cool as it is now. Um, and so I was kind of like, oh, like, this is so boring. I wish I could, you know, could get away. So I started my career in corporate retail uh, in the fashion and beauty industry, working at Gap in San Francisco, Gap headquarters, um, and a beauty company called Bear Essentials. And after a few years, I made the jump into startups, into uh, a Sequoia-backed tech company, and then um, working with Seth to start the Alt MBA, and then now with Maven. Um, so the past several years have been um, in the startup world. And what I find so exciting about startups is that a lot of times you're solving non-obvious problems. You're solving challenges where you, you have a hunch that something could be done better. No one is really doing it better though. And so there's this tension of, am I crazy? Am I just like, if this was that good of an idea, would someone have already been doing it? Right, and am I the right person to be tackling this? Do I have the the leverage and the skill sets and the the assets to be able to to move, you know, whatever it is I want to move in the direction I want to move it in? Um, and I think that's that's a, a really exciting possibility filled place to play. Yeah, interesting. You know, you talked about you were you were in retail and then you moved to tech startups and uh, then you went on to uh, founding your own uh, own startups, but. Uh, you know, are there any skill sets and assets which, you know, young people need to to build up, uh, which they can leverage later on uh, once they're out of college and, you know, they can get into the tech world uh, and start building companies? Absolutely. The top one I would say is sales and marketing. No matter what role you're in, no matter what your official job title is, you knowing how to sell your ideas will help you get further in your career, both for yourself and for your company. So sales isn't just limited to salespeople. If you're, um, you know, with with Maven, um, if you're a course builder, if you're working with instructors at all, if you're working with students at all, if you're working with coaches that work with instructors, anything that is public facing is marketing and sales. So um, I think definitely reading up on sales books, um, copywriting books. I mean, copywriting, a lot of it is sales, right? How do you, how do you message an idea so that the, your audience understands, believes, is bought in? That ability to get buy-in um, is so important for making sure that your ideas are seen and heard for what they are. I spent a long time assuming that if my idea was good, everyone should realize that. And if you didn't realize that, you were dumb and you didn't understand my genius, right? And, and I was very frustrated, not surprisingly, because I would just put something out there and expect people to understand it. But I realized that it's my responsibility to get people to care. No one owes you shit, right? Like they do not have to care. It is your responsibility as a creator, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as an intrapreneur working inside a company, you have to get people to care. So developing that skill set, if you if you improve on that or master that, um, I think your trajectory is just going to go up and to the right. Absolutely, I think sales and marketing is is one of the most important skill sets you know somebody can can build up. And uh, you know you uh, you one of the uh, uh, you know founders of Alt MBA. What were some of your learnings when you were growing Alt MBA to uh, five hundred cities and forty five countries? One of the biggest learnings from the Alt MBA is how much community matters in our daily lives and in learning. So learning, when you look at it from the outside, you might think it's 
facts, it's knowledge, it's information transfer, all things that feel very analytical, very arm's length. But if that were really all that we needed to change our own behavior, to change our mindset, then we could just read books, textbooks, and get to where we want to go. But that's not the case. We need the social component. We need the community. We need to be inspired. We need to feel understood. We need accountability. So with the Alt-MBA, we flipped the script on what online learning looked like at the time. So this was 2015 when, when online learning was basically Udemy and Skillshare courses, Coursera, edX, right? Creative Live sometimes, but basically video-driven, self-paced, self-guided courses. And I personally had signed up for some of these. I remember I had a calligraphy hand lettering class. I think I bought it for $25. I watched, I think, 30 minutes of the first lesson before saying I'm going to come back to it. And and then, you know, that was five years ago. Haven't looked back since. Um, Never logged back in. And a lot of people have this experience. And this is why um, video-driven courses, MOOCs, have a 6 to 7% completion rate. A lot of people are excited to learn something, but when you have unlimited flexibility to learn it, you end up not getting to it. There's no urgency. There's there's no skin in the game. So with the Alt-MBA, it was all about getting a group of people like-minded together for a month, diving in deep, curating who this class looks like. So you're learning just as much from the person to the right and left of you in Zoom. This is online. So to the right and left of you in Zoom, um, you're learning hands off by hands on doing. You're not just passively watching videos. You're actually putting into practice, producing, publishing, shipping work yourself. And that's a whole other layer of having skin in the game. And that's how we actually learn and process and stay on the hook, keep each other accountable, keep ourselves accountable. Um, and so really diving into that community element um, and focusing on that was a huge reason that the Alt MBA grew and continues to grow today. We did not outspend on marketing. We did not outspend on paid media. We didn't have a louder megaphone than all the other courses. It's very hard if you're competing with other courses and you plan on um, outspamming people, right? That's just, it's not gonna work. You cannot outspam um, the next course. Uh, you really have to focus on how do you add a ton of value to help your students achieve the goal that they want to achieve. And you see yourself as Yoda and they are Luke Skywalker. Our students, the Alden Bay students, they were the heroes. We were just Sherpas along the way. We were guides, we were um, supporters. We built the infrastructure to allow smart people to get together. And we gave them the setting for them to learn together and prompts to work on as groups, um, you know, in solo work, Uh, but really keeping your student front and center and thinking about how do you build community so that people tell their friends and that that word of mouth becomes the engine that attracts more like-minded people. And then it's this flywheel, the snowball that just kind of accumulates and grows in a really positive direction. Got it. And, uh, you know, uh, you talked about building community uh, and, you know, since we're all working remotely and learning remotely, uh, do you think community building comes from you know being active on slack communities and, and facebook groups uh, what what is uh, what did your you learn when you were looking at building community on on all day mm-hmm. it's never just about the tool so you can have a slack room and many communities do have slack rooms and they're dead they're silent okay. like one person comments every once in a while no one responds to that right so The fact that you have a Slack room does not mean that you have a community. A community, I think when we, when we say community, I think we, we throw the word around and it can mean so many different things to different people. So unpacking, what does that really mean when you say community um, is useful as, as a entrepreneur, as a course creator, um, so that you can think about which, which parts of community um, you want to lean more on. So there's a couple different aspects. One really big part of community that I think about is being weird in the same ways. So the difference between insiders versus outsiders is that in the inside of this community, we have shared language, we have shared context, we have shared terminology. 
so that we can speak in shorthand. And that speaking in shorthand is super useful. If you, if you think about different communities that you might be part of, um, there's this internal culture and, and people are weird in this, I call it weird in the same ways because people on the outside might not necessarily understand, but people on the inside really, really get it. So one of our alpha instructors in the six week course I'm teaching now, um, she has been in the military for 22 years. And um, she talks about how in the military, there's the word hua that, that military people say to each other. And she was explaining how hua can mean so many different things. It can work for any situation. It's, and, and she had a hard time describing what it was, but basically anyone in the military, when they hear that, they know what it means. My brother's in the military also. And so, you know, I've, I've heard him say that um, to his friends. And, um, and we were telling the story to another um, instructor um, in, a, in a later cohort. And that person just immediately was like, oh my gosh, yes. Like that's a great example because he knew that, right? Like even, even us saying that example, um, he immediately knew what that meant within the context of being in that military community. Um, and so, you know, and, and another community I'm part of is a, a plant, a bunch of different plant groups um, on Facebook and on, on Instagram, et cetera. So I'm really into plants. I have 75 plants in my house. Uh, you, you see a couple of them behind me, but they're kind of spread everywhere. And within the plant community, there's certain words that only plant people use. And there's certain, there's certain shared struggles. For example, fighting insect infestations, spider mites, thrips, scale, white flies, aphids, there's certain battle scars that you as a plant owner, if you have many plants, um, you've dealt with. And so there's a shared struggle that someone talks about dealing with infestation. You're immediately like, oh, I know, I feel you, right? There's that connection. And so you don't have to explain from scratch to an outsider. So that becomes really, really powerful because if you architect this as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, and you create that within your product within your brand, within your, your own um, company's community, you incentivize people in the community to try to attract people on the outside to get them on the inside. So with the Alt MBA, this was a great example because in the Alt MBA, we talk about shipping, dancing with fear, tension, creating change, um, doing the hard part first. To outsiders, it's like, what does that mean? Like, I, you can kind of guess what it might mean, but in the Alt MBA, that's, you know, every, every other sentence, people are using this, this internal vernacular. Um, and a lot of Alt MBA alum have told us that they, they got their coworkers, their boss, their direct reports to join the Alt MBA, that they got their spouse, their husbands and wives, their children, their parents, their siblings to do the Alt MBA because they got so much from the experience and they loved the internal shared language and shared context. And they wanted to have that shared context with their friends and family and coworkers. But their coworkers can't have that shared context unless they go through the Alt-MBA experience. So it becomes a really win-win situation for the Alt-MBA to grow and also for students and alum to be able to have this um, weird in the same way, shared language, to be able to talk and move faster with people that they work with on a daily basis, with people that they live with, so that everyone has that shared philosophy around work, around life, about you know innovation, etc. Got it. I think I think shared philosophy is is important to you know uh, build that community inside a company and inside inside you know when you're building a course. And uh, you know I wanted to understand is production value important. When you when you're building cohort based courses, it's really important to have a great equipment and you know great video quality uh, when you're trying to build courses. Production value is one of those things that I think new course creators overvalue when they first start. Your audience, your target students, are not signing up for your course because you have the flashiest, most polished videos. If they really wanted a very polished look, there's plenty of places to get that for free. YouTube is a great example. There's a lot of YouTubers with, with great setups, great video quality, great editing, right? And there's a lot of 
uh, um, Udemy courses that equally, LinkedIn Learning, Masterclass that have great production value. So what's scarce, what's rare is not how flashy your videos are. What's scarce is the group of people that you're bringing together, the live interactions, learning from each other, challenging each other in real time, the community aspect that we just talked about. Those are all the things that are hard to replicate in, in formats besides courses. So articles, podcasts, uh, YouTube videos, video-driven courses, these are all either free or you know, $20, $50. Um, and so optimizing for the best production quality isn't the most important thing. Um, it's great if you can. I mean, if you have great design sense, you have great, great branding taste, or you um, nerd out about um, iMovie and you know clipping videos and you have a nice DSLR, definitely go for it, right? Like that can be a moat for you. That can be a differentiator. Um, but if you don't, I wouldn't let that prevent you from teaching what you know and bringing a community together. And you know, when it comes to uh, courses and cohort based courses, how do you how do you decide on the on the pricing? Uh, you know, what pricing? It, it does pricing depend on the length of the course, or uh, you know, on on the topic of the course? Pricing is a whole beast. So we can we can definitely spend an, an hour unpacking pricing. I'll give a couple high level pointers um, that that could help get new course creators started. So first is to understand that pricing is a story. We overpay or underpay for things all the time based on how we prioritize and value different products and services. So just because someone, a certain demographic has disposable income, doesn't mean that they will spend it on your product or your course. There are a lot of people that um, don't wanna spend 99 cents on an app they're gonna use every day but are willing to spend six fifty dollars for a latte at Starbucks every day, right? And so that, that irrational behavior applies to courses too. So really the thing you wanna start with is understanding your ideal target student and what are the things that they find juicy and valuable and urgent and important that they wanna spend money on? That, if that, absolutely affects willingness to pay. So if, if you are saying that you're gonna help someone close more business and grow their business, um, grow their consulting practice, make more sales, get promoted, right? These are all pretty juicy offerings, um, right? So the juicier the, the value prop, the more urgent and important it is, the more people are likely to wanna pay for that. It's kind of the, the analogy of the vitamin and the painkiller. If, if what you're offering is more of a vitamin, it takes a little bit more um, nurturing to get your audience to understand why is this urgent. If the problem is painful and it's happening a lot and I want it solved yesterday, I'm willing to pay a lot for you to help me, to teach me how to solve this problem. So understanding your target audience is, is, the, number, is the number one thing. Um, and then, and then the second thing is thinking about your own assets and levers and constraints. So you personally, what are you best at? What are the questions that people ask you all the time? What are the things that people are already paying for you to solve? So maybe you don't have a course, but you have a coaching or consulting practice. What are people already paying you for? What are they paying for your Substack for, right? What are, they, what are people asking you to speak about or guest lecture about? So all of us have a unique blend of skills. So really looking internally for what value can you provide to other people um, where you have credibility and expertise and trust for you to be able to help your audience, that's the second step. So step one is looking, looking at your audience. That's kind of external, looking at your audience. Step two is looking internally at yourself uh, and then looking at that, at that overlap. So um, I would start there from a first principles perspective. And then from, an, from a learning by analogies perspective, it's also useful to see, well, what are other people charging for courses, right? Because your course is being compared to these other courses. You're actually being compared to non-courses too. 
if I can learn this topic from YouTube or $25 Udemy course, or just by reading a bunch of articles on Medium, maybe I'll do that as opposed to your course, right? So you're actually, you're not just being compared to other similar courses. You're, you're being compared across all learning alternatives. So um, understanding what's the range of what courses charge is useful. And for corporate-based course, corporate -based courses, the range goes from $500 per student to $5,000 per student. So that's obviously a, a very large range. Um, and then within that, obviously there's different value propositions and, and student outcomes that, that each course is promising, right? Again, what we talked about with the, the more valuable, the value prop, the more people are willing to pay. Course length can also be a factor. Um, it, can be, it can be harder to say, well, I wanna charge $1,000 for a one day course versus I wanna charge $1,000 for a four week course. But it doesn't mean that you can't charge $1,000 for a one day course. There are people who charge that. There are people who charge that for live workshops, for example, right? Um, and so it really depends on your credibility, your um, the amount of trust and eagerness that your audience has to learn from you. Um, but length can be an easier way to say, you know, if you're, if you're self-conscious about the price, what's a good amount of time where it feels like this is enough time for me to help my students go from where they want to go to where, to, to, from where they are to where they want to go. Sometimes one day just isn't enough to teach someone everything you know about a topic. It probably isn't. You can only, you can only go so far. You probably have to stay pretty surface level or narrow your scope by a lot to be able to cover something in a day. Um, but if it's a couple weeks, several weeks, it's more time for you to, to add value and help your, help your student transform. So those are all some things to think about when setting your course price. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you can charge as much as people are willing to pay you. That's kind of the simplest um, way to think about it. Got it, got it. And, uh, you know, for all MBA, you had an around 96% completion rate of, you know, uh, it could be because of the community and uh, and the course content. Uh, and, you know, uh, for uh, what is the what is the one main metric that you looked at uh, uh, when people were able to complete and successfully complete uh, courses on all the MBA? Is it student outcomes or the completion of the entire course? We definitely prioritize student outcomes and student transformation. We, we designed the entire Alt MBA to be around behavior change. So not short term, I'm inspired after I hear a great TED talk. I'm inspired for 30 minutes after and I feel like I can take on the world, right? Like that's short term inspiration. We wanted long term behavior change where our students and alumni would do their work differently and be more open to taking risks, to experimenting, to shipping, to putting themselves out there um, permanently. And so that was what the entire, entire four weeks, the, the projects, the hands-on group work, the coaches that we had working with students, all that was designed to help students transform their own behavior and their own mindset. So that was the ultimate um, bar that we looked at. Um, completion rate was important for us too, because we, you know, if someone is signing up and dropping out in the first week, what are the chances that they actually finish that transformation? Probably not very high, right? So we needed people to, to stay in the process long enough for that transformation to happen. And when it comes to real learning, a lot of times it can be hard and uncomfortable and painful. It can feel like a struggle because you are trying to do something new. You don't fully understand it yet. You're kind of poking and prodding. You're applying a lesson that you thought you understood, but then you try it and it doesn't work. And so you're kind of like, okay, well, what did I do wrong, right? So there's a lot of negotiating happening with you and yourself, trying to understand and grapple with this new thing that you are trying to learn. And all of that can be discouraging. It can be frustrating. If without the right um, infrastructure in place, without the right levers and accountability in place, the easy thing to do is to drop out, to just say, I'm going to come to this later. Right. I mean, for all the all the people who have said, I want to learn how to code or I want to learn how to be a better copywriter or whatever, like, well, why aren't we better coders and copywriters? Well, because we tried it. It was hard. And we said we're going to come back to it. And then we never did. So we looked at the completion rate as a sign of how can we hold ourselves as course creators accountable 
to our students by designing something so thoughtful that we prevent people from just dropping out if when things get hard. So that's why we have a one to 10 coach ratio. Um, that's why there's so much accountability with group members, students, fellow students, keeping each other accountable, not just looking to Alton B staff. Um, that's why the projects are designed to layer so that students, uh, their, their learning um, gets sharper and sharper as they get closer to the end of the program. So they feel encouraged. They can see their own progress. They can see their own work output, right? So that they uh, stay motivated. So we put all of these different hooks in place so that um, students would work through the hard parts to make it through to the other end to see that light at the end of the tunnel. Got it. And you know what I want to talk about, uh, Maven. Uh, you know what is what is the application process for for Maven, and uh, uh, is it you know pre-recorded uh, or not pre-recorded, and you know how many how many more courses are you planning to come in future? You mean the the application process to take a course? Yes. Uh, the yes. R six week course, or to to become uh, or to take any course on Maven. Uh, yeah, application process to take any course on, on Maven. Gotcha. Maven is a, a marketplace and a platform. So we have instructors of all walks of life. We welcome instructors from all different topics and functions, um, as long as you're credible in what you teach. Um, so some courses have application processes and some don't. And then within courses with applications, some are pretty light. They're more about just getting, getting to know a student, share your LinkedIn profile. What are the topics you're most excited to learn about? Those questions help the instructor tailor the course to what students would get the most out of. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, there's applications that are more rigorous. So there might be short essay questions. Um, there might be um, you know more stringent qualifications that you might need to meet. <clears throat> So courses where curating the community, curating a specific kind of person, um, curating a person who has a certain um, intermediate or advanced level, for example, um, if that matters, then having a more uh, strict application process is usually what the instructor will do. Uh, but because we are a platform, um, we welcome, you know, if you, if you as an instructor don't want an application process, great. There's a lot of courses that don't have applications. Um, and if you want one, great. We're going to give you examples of what that application could look like. And how big is the cohort? Uh, is, is it, uh, I believe for all time, it was around hundred people in one cohort, but for Maven, do you, do you have the same structure? Again, we're super open. So if you want hundred, great. If you want a thousand, awesome. If you want 20, that's also awesome. So that's the beauty of a platform, uh, in my opinion, that's why I'm so excited about this business, because I think that there are so many ways that you could put together a great course based around you as an instructor, your strengths, your weaknesses, your expertise, your um, preferences, and then on what your students prefer. So if you want to run cohorts with 30 students, 50 students, awesome. If you want to aim for a thousand students, great. We want to provide the tooling and um, and know-how to help you be able to do that. The other thing about student count, same with pricing and um, how intense your course is, a bunch of different levers, is you can iterate as you go. So you might start your first cohort with 30 people. Great, you learn from it, you see what people got the most value from, you see what parts they didn't really care about and you trim that from your course. Uh, you start off with two weeks and you extend to three or four weeks, or you start off with six weeks and you decide to trim it down to three weeks, that's all very possible. So the, the first iteration that you put out does not need to be perfect. It just needs to offer value for your student. As long as your students are finding it valuable and they would rank rate it highly, that's that's really what matters. And then in between cohorts, you can decide to, um, to flex up and down and change some of the way that your course is set up. So my philosophy around course building is to have a modular approach. Modular as in Ikea, there's, I have a closet um, structure from Ikea where you can mix and match. Do you want drawers here or do you want shelves here? 
Do you want a, a hanging rack or do you want um, a shoe, you know, shoe rack, right? So within the components, you can mix and match and build something that is the right size for your closet that suits your unique needs that, you know, works for you. So course building, I think about in a, in a very similar way. So you have your component parts and then you mix and match them. Um, and you can, you can play around with it and you can explore and you can learn what best suits your student. And, uh, you know, I uh, wanted to understand about uh, content creation. Uh, how do I add, you know, a spiky point of view uh, when it comes to creating a content to stand out uh, from so much of content, which is outside? Uh, how do I differentiate myself uh, when it comes to content creation? Sorry, real quick, we can trim this. Did we, were we recording earlier? Did you, were you recording on a different platform or did we just start recording? Cause I just noticed a little zoom record. Uh, no, we, we are recording right now. Oh, we were. Okay. Okay. Cause the little record thing just popped up on my screen. So I don't know if it was, if we captured, we did capture the earlier part. We did. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Good. All right. Just wanted to make sure. <clears throat> okay. We can obviously trim this part out. Um, Okay, so you were asking about a spiky point of view. Yes. Do you mind repeating the question, and then we'll we'll pick up from there? Sure. Um, you know, when when it comes to content creation, how do I add you know a spiky point of view in order to stand out from so much of content which is outside uh, on the internet? A spiky point of view is super important because whatever you're doing, there are thousands of people like you who are probably doing something similar, similar work backgrounds, similar educational backgrounds, similar types of offerings, similar types of ideas maybe. So if you don't stand out, then you don't have a chance to prove to your client or to your customer how different you really are. So a spiky point of view is your unique take on your industry that's rooted in your expertise. And it's something that other people might disagree with. If your spiky point of view is something that everyone would agree with, that doesn't add anything new, then it's not spiky enough. It's too generic. It's too vague. And if you think about the people that you follow on Instagram, on Twitter, the newsletters that you follow, they're probably from people with spiky points of view. They're people with something to say that are brave enough to say it, that defend the, the assertion and their thesis and their hypothesis, and you learn something new from reading their content. So that's really what you wanna do is you want your spiky point of view to teach something that people don't already know, that makes them think, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way, Rohit, but now that you say that, that's a really good idea. And it makes me wanna think through other areas of my work using that lens. Right, so that freshness, but the grain of truth, those two Venn diagrams combined, um, that's really what what makes um, makes your point of view stand out. So, uh, a spike point of view is a great way to um, differentiate yourself because spike points of view are hard to replicate based on your life experiences, based on your personality, based on your work, the actual um, experiences that you've had that shapes your philosophy on things, right? And I, I think one great example is, um, is tools versus strategy. This was, this was a, a friend I was talking to. He was saying that um, he works on, on um, he's an automation consultant. So he'll set up workflow automations. And he was saying that a lot of automation consultants talk about the tools, like what are the tools, the technology? Um, and he thinks that the tool is not that important. It's really about uh, the strategy behind it and what, what is the core thing that you're trying to do. And then once you, you figure out the core thing, any kind of tool can, can, is fungible. A lot of different tools can get you there, right? So that's a spiky point of view that he said has helped him stand out and land calls with prospective clients who were um, attracted to the fact that he was willing to be a beacon, a lighthouse saying, I believe this, I am brave enough to say it. So there definitely is an element of courage involved in a spiky point of view, because the, the reason why most of us aren't 
spikier is because people might criticize you, right? If everyone's talking about tools, if you're the one who's not talking about tools, people are, you know, they could, they could reply on your tweet and say like, you're an idiot or like, you don't know what you're talking about or whatever. And that, that can feel scary. We don't want to put ourselves out there, but if you take the risk to put yourself out there to share what you believe will actually help your client or your customer, it should be something you really believe in, right? Like not, you shouldn't stir the pot and be a contrarian for the sake of it. Uh, no one likes the person who just says hot takes just to get, to rile people up and, and, and stir controversy. It should be something that you genuinely believe in. Um, if you take that risk and put yourself out there, um, a lot of times you're, you're paid back for it in terms of attracting the exact kind of person that is looking for someone like you and, and really has been waiting for someone like you to finally say something that they've been thinking all along. They thought they were alone, right? They finally read something that, that Rohit says that, that they've believed all along. And, and, you know, going back to what we said about community, that's again, building that community of like-minded people who have a certain philosophy, who are weird in the same ways, who believe the same kind of things. If you think about the most powerful brands that are out there, they have certain philosophies. They are spiky brands that stand for something. And that attracts people who believe the same and, um, and have that shared philosophy. And, you know, I think a spiky point of view is, is important to, you know, differentiate yourself, but you should not, also not, uh, uh, you know, say, say weird things just for the sake of it. Uh, and, and, you know, I want to know, you know, education had been, ha had an inflection point in 2020. Uh, what do you think about the future of education and unbundling of universities? Do you think, uh, uh, you know, if not Ivy League universities, do you think uh, this will be the end of uh, universities and, you know, face-to-face uh, -face lectures and uh, universities, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think education, higher ed, getting unbundled is really good for all the stakeholders, for everyone involved. I think on the student side, before, if you wanted a structured way to learn, going to college felt like the easy next step, right? That was the thing that everyone would do. And so in terms of, of going through the motions, that, that was the thing that, that you should do. And that would set you up for being able to get a good job, right? Most of us went to college because we wanted a good career. And now, because there are so many different ways to learn because of the internet, you as a working professional, as a student, can put together different, uh, different ways to learn. You can form your own interdisciplinary education in many ways. Self-teaching has become much more possible because there's YouTube, there's Udemy, there's Skillshare, there's cohort-based courses. I have a, a friend who's a, a full-time designer who self is self-taught. There's actually a lot of designers who are self-taught, right? Because there's so many great resources out there, so many forums and communities um, where you can share what you're learning um, and, and learn from each other, right? And learn from the best experts around the world, regardless of distance, of physical proximity. So the fact that physical proximity is no longer limiting us, I think is really, really exciting. Um, and I also think that there, our culture is changing from a culture that's very credential based and accomplishment like certification driven to actual work output and actual um, projects that you've shipped, actual work that you've produced, right? So instead of having a degree and going to, you know, going to school to study um, film, let's say, if you have a portfolio of short films that you've been making and video clips, if you build an audience on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram, there are so many creators that didn't go to, you know, to get their, their MFA, uh, their master's of fine arts, but have thriving careers doing what they love, making their art and sharing it directly with their fans. And they didn't need, they didn't need to have a, you know, a, a, a master's degree from a famous school to be able to start doing that. So I think that the fact that there are fewer gatekeepers for people to share their craft, to build their careers is a really great thing. And, and I think in general, moving away from certifications and, and credentials to, to actual work accomplishments is 
much better for employers too, right? Like as an employer, do I really care if someone took a sales course or studied business or if they can sell, if they can prove to me that they can sell because their writing is so good, because they've built their audience, because they've built a solo consulting practice, right? Like those are all signs that someone can sell. Um, and I would rather have that um, as proof of work, <clears throat> as proof of work than, than credentials on paper. So the internet and the unbundling of, of, of learning, I think um, moving in, the, in that direction of more openness, fewer gatekeepers, the new gatekeepers are actually your proof of work. So, um, you know, before it's like you had to be picked by um, uh, a talent scout or picked by Harvard's admissions committee or picked by um, Sony Music. And now the new gatekeeper is, can you build an audience? So it's still hard because that, that takes skill, but it's a different kind of gatekeeping where I think it's much more, um, it's much more open in that everyone can try. And, um, and there are different ways to improve and learn and get better at something as opposed to trying to please, you know, a committee of five people to, to vote in your favor or, you know, to, to pick you over a bunch of other candidates auditioning for the same role, going directly to your, to your audience um, and proving to them that you can offer value. I think mean, that's, that's really exciting. Got it. And, uh, you know, as I quickly want to the top three, what's your favorite business book? Favorite business book? Um, the Challenger Sale is a great book. I've recommended that to, um, to a bunch of people. Um, and uh, I think sales books in general are great. Um, and then Lynchpin by Seth Godin is also fantastic. Got it. We'll put that in the show notes. And you know, if you could go, go back in time when you started Maven, uh, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently? We started Maven six months ago. So it was, it was fairly recent. I don't have any top of mind regrets um, yet. Um, I think we were, we tried to be as thoughtful as possible um, about our decisions and, and a lot of our decisions are still playing out. So that's the other thing, right? Sometimes there's a, a longer feedback loop with decision, decisions that you make now that you know, come to fruition you know, a year from now, two years from now, strategic directions. So um, come back to me in a, in a year, we'll sync back up and, and say, oh, I wish I would have done this or that differently. Got it. Yeah, maybe you can, you can sing back later. Uh, uh, and uh, do you have any favorite online tools? For example, uh, Gmail, Slack, Zoom. What was that? Sorry, do you mind? It cut out a little bit. Uh, do you have any favorite online tools? For example, Gmail, Slack, Zoom. Oh, favorite online tool. Um, hmm. I do love Zoom. Um, I think it's it's opened up, you know, people being able to live chat on video with each other in a very easy way. Um, actually, you know what? Another another tool that I really like recently is Icebreaker. Icebreaker is a is a um, how would I describe it? It gives you different fun questions. It it matches you up either in, in a small group or one on one, and um, it asks you different fun questions. Um, to get to know people better. So it's great for community building. We use it in, um, in our courses and uh, the product is beautifully built. It's very intuitive um, and it's just a lot of fun. So whenever you hop on one, you, you, you can't help but, um, but get excited and, and kind of like get sucked into the excitement of, of um, that icebreaker session. So I would recommend icebreaker. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, uh, Wes, what, uh, what are the best way people can reach out to you and know more about Maven? Maven.com is our website. We're also doing a six-week course on how to teach instructors how to build courses. So if anyone's interested in that, we have an application process for that. And then my website is westko.com. And I'm also on Twitter, tweeting a lot about a lot of the things that we talked about today. Got it. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, Wes, thank you so much for taking our time and speaking to us. I really enjoyed my conversation with you. Thanks, Rohit.